There are tons of new innovations happening in the hydrogen world, and it's far from being dead. The ultimate question will be if batteries can win the race with breakthroughs in energy density. And if batteries do not dramatically increase in energy density, then we will likely see some hydrogen vehicles take over a portion of the market. Hydrogen can be produced from several different methods, but the two most known ways are electrolysis and methane pyrolysis. Electrolysis requires electricity to separate water, so theoretically this can be derived from renewable sources. Extraction from methane also produces hydrogen via thermal splitting, but this can be more controversial since they have some degree of CO2 emissions. However, there have been some alternative methods which have been designed recently. One notable design is a modular reactor produced by NuScale Power. Their single NPM unit can produce around 50 tons of hydrogen per day, which can support around 38,000 fuel cell vehicles. This would also avoid 460 tons of CO2 daily when compared to extraction from natural gas. Its energy is derived in the form of superheated steam, and electricity is sent directly to a high temperature electrolysis system. There are plans to build the first plant by 2030, and multiple modular units can be combined to produce enormous amounts of hydrogen. Once again, this project is really worth following because this could solve some of the production issues associated with hydrogen. Now you still have to distribute the fuel source. And yes, that is a bit of a problem in bigger countries. But smaller nations like South Korea are already building strong supportive fueling networks. And a lot of governments are jumping on board the hydrogen train, so to speak. Because it can be a green fuel if produced correctly. So the industry is definitely still growing and it is far from being dead. So the main question is, is why would you actually need hydrogen in the first place and how does this work as a fuel source? Well, most of the vehicles we will look at actually utilize fuel cells. Now, fuel cells work kind of like batteries and they produce electricity as long as hydrogen fuel is provided. Fuel cells can last for a very long time and they consist of two electrodes. Hydrogen is fed through the anoid and air is exposed into the cathode. A catalyzer splits hydrogen molecules into protons and electrons. Thus, the electrons go through an electrical circuit and ultimately powers an electric motor. So in some sense, it's kind of like a hybrid vehicle, but these fuel cells pack a higher energy density. So they could provide longer ranges for electric cars and they are light enough to be used in aircraft, which is a pretty distinct advantage. Now, technically, hydrogen can also be used as a direct fuel source in itself. Now, this concept is nothing new, and there have been aircraft in the past which have ran on direct hydrogen fuel. But Toyota is currently working on a 1600cc inline three-cylinder turbo, which actually runs on compressed hydrogen. And it'll be interesting to see what the power to weight ratios are for this type of configuration. This also leads us into the Airbus E series of aircraft. They have designed multiple variants and they hope to bring a real prototype within the next 10 years. Now surprisingly there have been aircraft in the past that have ran on direct hydrogen fuel. So Airbus is contemplating on whether or not to actually use fuel cells or actually to use gaseous hydrogen in the engines. Now there are still a lot of questions associated with actually storing hydrogen on the plane because it does take up quite a bit of volume in gaseous form. Nevertheless, it's still very challenging to design an aircraft which is solely powered by heavy batteries. So it's not really surprising to see Airbus actually prioritize with a hydrogen design. The same story kind of goes for electric VTOLs as well, and many startup companies are actually looking at hybrid fuel cell vehicles, which can provide longer ranges. Now, another really good vehicle worth mentioning is the Alstom Island Train. And kind of like I mentioned before, supporting fuel cell vehicles can be tricky because you need to have quite a few stations to support a strong network in a larger country. But a hydrogen train going from A to B and then B to A would probably make a little bit more sense in terms of building hydrogen infrastructure. They have already developed their island which can carry 300 passengers up to 1000 kilometers at 140 kilometers per hour. The fuel cell and hydrogen tank are placed on the roof of the train 
with the lower portion being fitted with motors and batteries. Power is derived from the fuel cells, but braking also stores energy into the battery system. The company expects more than 5,000 passenger diesel trains to be retired around 2035. So this could be a huge potential market for hydrogen power. Now another neat craft developed is the Energy Observer. And there are quite a few boats out there which are powered by fuel cells, but the Energy Observer is a brilliant combination utilizing multiple power sources. It has both solar panels and fuel cells for continuous power. The fuel cells utilize a desalination and electrolysis method. However, this process does take up quite a bit of power, so it's still debatable on whether or not this can be feasible to have an onboard conversion system. So this type of boat is pretty heavily reliant on more advancements in electrolysis technology. But it can run with hydrogen for three days without refueling. Finally, Hyundai, Toyota, and even Honda are all building their own type of hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. All three vehicles have a very similar price and driving range. And since hydrogen is a little bit more expensive than regular fuel, multiple fuel credit programs are being offered with the initial purchase or lease of the vehicle. There are also many concepts with one of the most extreme being the Apex H2 with hydrogen stored in tanks and then converted into electrical energy through a fuel cell. Its single motor will clock in at around 60 kilowatts and it will top out at a modest 90 miles per hour. The company also claims that the bike will start at around $10,000, which is obviously a little bit low for something revolutionary, so I would take that with a grain of salt. Now obviously there is the Nikola Motor Company, and as of right now I'm going to refrain from getting too in depth about their vehicles. They are claiming to be building multiple hydrogen variants, but given their track history I'm very skeptical on what they will deliver. Then there's also the Lavo home battery, which is an electrolysis system which combines electrolysis, hydrogen storage, and fuel cell. So it's an all-in-one package. It's fairly large at 700 pounds, but it stores around 40 kilowatt hours, which is considerably more than a Tesla Powerwall. Now the company claims that it has a shelf life of 30 years, but I'm a little bit skeptical of that because obviously we'd have to find a compressor which lasts this long. And obviously this is going to be really expensive, so it does bring up a debate on whether or not this is actually economical. But it is interesting to see that companies are starting to come out with hydrogen storage systems. As a conclusion, hydrogen is not going anywhere anytime soon. Countries like South Korea and Japan are excellent places to observe in the near term future. And we will see if fuel cell vehicles really take off in these countries. Hydrogen power may not actually happen if there is a breakthrough battery which has a high energy density and is economical. But a completely different power source could also emerge which would eliminate both batteries and hydrogen. So the future is very hard to predict, but I think we will know the conclusion of this race within the next 10 years. So once again, thanks for watching. Please like the video if you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe to my channel.